Uh, this week, as you guys probably know, Billy Graham passed away. And even though uh, many of you are too young to perhaps remember, it's important uh, to speak about uh, such a great man, I believe. Um, I, as a young person, I was a hip eye in Maui and uh, crashing in someone's house uh, 46 years ago. And an older plumber came to fix something in the house. And, uh, you know, I was not really used to older plumbers at that time. So uh, he was a very straight-looking old man, you know, probably younger than I am, but gray-haired dude. And so uh, I remember one moment in the bathroom, I remember this moment, he looked at me and he said, um, you know, with love in his heart, he said, hey, uh, we're showing a Billy Graham movie, um, and I'd like to be able to invite you to come. I remember like, oh my gosh, he's talking to me. I can't believe it. So, But he sincerely was inviting me. Uh, I wasn't ready to go. Um, but the genuineness of that contact with a man, mentioning Billy Graham. And then my beautiful wife, when she was 21, she was a hippette. And she uh, knelt in front of her TV. Um, and when Billy Graham, that same man, was speaking and prayed a prayer. It wasn't the tipping point for her life, but it was another moment in time. And then I was ordained an evangelist after I was six months in the Lord, 1972. Uh, but by 1983, I was traveling, of course, as an evangelist. And uh, he invited evangelists from around the world to go to Amsterdam. And God provided for me to go uh, with 5,000 other evangelists from around the world, all the nations of the world. You know, stayed in rooms with folks from Africa and Asia. And so we're all there together. It's incredible. And all of a sudden, one night we're eating. And imagine how big a room has to be to feed 5,000 people. It was a massive room. Uh, but all of a sudden, you hear this stirring and you see people starting to run. And I can get emotional about it because Billy Graham came. <laughs> into our little cafeteria area and comes from the back, you know, and you see all these, you know, young evangelists from around the world scurrying, you know, like little mice, you know, and I wanted to too, you know, but I was kind of deferring. I was a little bit embarrassed. I didn't want to, you know, <laughs> but I wanted to in my heart, but I also was deferring to the, you know, other nations of the world that don't get to see him. But then I'll never forget this moment. He's, you know, a tall man, uh, or was. Anyway, uh, he's prone right now. But anyway, uh, he was, was standing head and shoulders above all of them. And uh, they're all around him with their hands up. It was you know, a moment in time where he's continuing to try and walk, and the entourage is going, you know, 75, 100 of them. And he's a very humble man. This is no kind of ego thing involved at all. He just uh, was coming to greet and to love and to, and to embrace them. I just think about uh, the, the grace that was on that man's life. And when he passed away, it was a big deal. You know, there was kind of a hush in my heart as, uh, you know, kind of dad left the house, you know. And um, I always felt safer knowing he was on the planet, that if anything really crazy happened, you know, Billy would text him and say, quit it, you know. Anyway, but... <laughs> <laughs> A little overstated. He's kind of been out of the loop for a while, but um, it's very honoring to remember the giants who have gone before us. And so uh, I just want to pray for his family. Father, I pray for his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, just the incredible legacy of this man. And I pray for more like him, Lord. I know it's a lofty goal. He's a giant for the ages, and it's hard to imagine anyone ever reaching that stature again in our culture that is so tweaked on so many levels, but uh, you're able to do it, Lord. And so raise up another generation of giants to represent you well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Today, um, we're talking about the book of Exodus, Finding Authentic Freedom. My name, Francis, means free one. So whether I knew it or not, I've always been hardwired to be free. And initially, that freedom... Uh, produced a lot of chaos, a lot of jumping into things that didn't produce freedom. Uh, there was free access to them, but they ultimately made me very bound. And some of you understand that. Uh, you jumped in as well. We're going to talk about uh, the gods of the Israelites. Um, when we looked at the chapter I'd be given, I was given the chapters on the plagues of Egypt. And so I know a lot of you guys, before you go to bed at night, usually play those chapters just on the 10 plagues of Egypt before you drift off into sleep. And just, just to think about them and get a little hug. But uh, I 
uh, I reflected on them and learned a lot of things um, that I think are incredibly important. I did not know, I should have, but I didn't, that all the plagues of Egypt were connected to the gods of Egypt. And I also did not know that the Egyptians were really the secondary audience. You would think, well, certainly the Egyptians who were being affected by the plagues were the primary audience. They were secondary. The primary audience were the Israelites who were living in Goshen, who had also grown up under those gods as well. Uh, They did not really know their Hebrew God. He was kind of lost in the shuffle. They kind of had a relationship, but a lot needed to be restored. But they certainly, just as we are coming from the world, which is a type of Egypt, out of um, Egypt through the Red Sea, which is baptism, into our promised land, which is freedom from the flesh conquering all the dimensions of the tribes of our flesh, the Hivites, Jebusites, Backbites, Adicites, Mosquito Bites, all the ites <laughs> that assault us. Uh, and because they were not ready to go in the land, even two of them, Joshua and Caleb, went in and said, we're ready for this. Ten of them said, Ixne on the Otfe, and then they wound up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until they died, and then their children went into the wilderness. So uh, I, as long as I have breath in me, want to be alive, willing to conquer the flesh, the areas in my life where the enemy has really brought plagues because of the gods I attach myself to uh, in my life. And all of us have them. So we're going to look at that uh, today. Billy Graham said this, anything can become an idol to us. That is something we put in place of God. So something you put in place of God becomes an idol. When you are practicing idolatry, there's always demonic entities that begin to attach themselves to you. And so that may sound extreme, but it's not. When I received Jesus, because I worshiped other gods on lots of levels, when I invited Jesus in, the necklaces I used to chant to Krishna, which is a Hindu god, which is actually a demonic spirit, that, that entity that I would worship uh, bound me. And I found my hands frozen at my side. I prayed my first prayer, Jesus come into my heart. Then I prayed my second prayer, Jesus help my hands come up that are frozen. And I ripped necklaces off. I expected uh, at that point, um, since that day, since I saw hundreds of beads go around the ground, to see people get saved in that way. But I know, because of firsthand experience, that demonic entities control people's lives. And we give ourselves over to idols, which then are gods, which then produce plagues, and then God needs to set us free from those things. Now, uh, this is a, a, a heavy message today, and we're going to read a portion of Scripture that, though written 2,000 years ago, could go back for thousands of years and is just as much applicable today as at any time in history. And yet to read it, I mean, it's like, whoa, that can be very controversial. Now, this is not a politically correct set of scripture. This is a biblically correct set of scripture. And at the end of the day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I understand that it costs something to be a Christian. 40 million people have given their lives in following Jesus down through the centuries. And even last year, 40,000 Christians gave their lives. It may not be happening at a neighborhood near you, but it may come to America. And I would just say to you that America is not exempt. Uh, you know, for those of us who have studied eschatology, you can look for America. You're not going to find it in the Bible. You can, you know, perhaps it was, no, but you can actually see, and I, I can really do see, uh, some of the other uh, nations, Greek and Roman empires uh, that existed, and even some futuristic empires, but Persian Empire, but ultimately. America can come and go. And nations have come and gone. And their gods, which produced their plagues, have taken them out. And they became blimps, speed bumps in history. And so we don't get a pass because we think we're a Judeo-Christian nation. Well, we we once had a a little element of that, but the vestige of that is really, really faded fast. And so when you listen to this, it reads contemporary. And it is very challenging, but it's the word of God for all generations. Now, as you listen... I also want you to know that God is love, and God loves all people. And so the fact that he has a standard of what's right and wrong uh, does not mean he's trying to hurt someone. I mean, God was believing something different than I was. 
And ultimately, I had to submit to him. Now, as an atheist for seven years, all five years of university, mock God, mock Christians, wrote papers against the Bible in college, and yet when push came to shove, when following my gods and my plagues brought me to suicide, I cried out with a knife in my hand, God help me. And at that point, he separated me from my partying friends, put me on a plane a week later in Sacramento to go to a place I'd never been with $100 in my pocket. And so I understand what it's like to have to leave the world on a journey to try and find God. Six months later, I then came to Christ. But this is a heavy portion of scripture in Romans 1. It is a translation that I like, New Living Translation, that I listen to regularly, uh, every day, my wife would say, every day I listen to the Word of God in cars, walking, oh, washing, lots of different ways in the morning. So here it is, Romans chapter 1. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who push the truth away from themselves. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship Him as God or even give Him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. The result was that their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they became utter fools instead. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people or birds and animals and snakes. So God let them go ahead and do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Instead of believing what they knew was the truth about God, they deliberately chose to believe lies. So they worshipped the things God made, but not the Creator Himself, who is to be praised forever. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. The men, instead of having normal sexual relationships with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men and as a result suffered within themselves the penalty they so richly deserved. When they refused to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their evil minds and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, fighting, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They are forever inventing new ways of sinning and are disobedient to their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises, and are heartless and unforgiving. They are fully aware of God's death penalty for those who do these things, yet they go right ahead and do them anyway, and worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. So this is a very, this is a very challenging section of Scripture uh, that challenges the mores, the sexual uh, values of our culture, uh, which we're always seemingly trying to step out in new dimensions and call the new morality something new and fresh when it's actually just very old immorality that has been around for thousands of years and has candidly destroyed ultimately entire cultures. Rome, Greece, throughout history, these things uh, have affected, uh, infected even, uh, other cultures. And so I've got dear friends in the gay community who I love, I communicate with regularly, but uh, they know where I am, where I stand, and what I believe. And I love them, uh, but just like I don't always love everything someone I love believes, I can't believe everything they would believe. Um, some of you who are married, you actually live with someone you don't agree with. And so uh, that person, you form relationships with them in, in which you come to terms about the things you're going to major on and not major on. And if you major on the things you don't agree on, then uh, you may be alone after a while. But um, 42 years later, my wife and I uh, regularly, we try to do 
disagree as often as we can, and um, that enables us then to understand each other in a brand new way. And honestly, it just produces, there are things that we are wired different, different perspectives, and these are not sin issues. These are just perspective attitude issues. And even within our culture, it's very, very difficult because people are very adamant and strong about what they believe, and now that produces then breaches within our culture uh, that I think God wants to heal. I know God wants to heal. Um, The author of all the deception we read about uh, was a archangel in heaven named Lucifer. And here's a quote from him. He said at one point, boasting, I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. I'll be God. I'll make my own rules. Instead, the retort to that statement, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. And the reality is that God, even with the Egyptians, uh, was going to make a statement, not primarily for them, but for the Hebrews who are watching and for us, the Bible says these things are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. So generationally they come down to us. But speaking to the Egyptians, God said in Exodus 12, 12, I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt for I am the Lord. And after this, the Egyptians will know that I'm the Lord. So uh, when, when the judgment comes even in our own lives, the Bible says if we would judge ourselves, we would not have to be judged. But if we refuse to receive the exhortation of God, the reproofs of instruction, the Bible says, that are the way of life, then ultimately we set in motion a chain reaction of consequence that will take place in each of our lives. But he was trying to get their attention. Uh, some of the plagues um, they uh, said they'd respond to, but ultimately did not. Now, the, the plagues of Egypt were connected to the gods of Egypt, and many of them were connected to the animals that surrounded them. So they made gods of animals, and some of the faces there are animal faces, but uh, they made gods of these creatures, baboons, beetles, uh, bulls, cats, cobras, cows, crocodiles, dolphins, dogs, frogs, fish, goose, or geese, um, hawks, hippopotami, uh, jackals, lionesses, rabbits, rams, snakes, scorpions, vultures, and wolves. So they made gods. When they saw an animal that had a quality that was of interest to them, they made it a god. And they esteemed it more highly. And we can do that with people in this age as well. But here's kind of a brief overview of their god. So Ra, the first one there, you, you probably have heard the Egyptian chant, Ra, Ra, Sis, Boom, Ba. You ever guys say that? I know, it just traveled... That's a little joke there. Anyway, so uh, he is the beginning of life. Again, every one of their gods had to do with a quality, an attribute that is actually found in the one true God, but designated then to fictitious gods, which were actually demonic entities. The mother goddess. Ironically, the mother goddess, Mut, which is not a very attractive name for a mother. But anyway, uh, she actually had male and female genitalia. Uh, again, not a new thought for this age. Ammon, he is the kidden god. Uh, Kansu, the, the sixth protector. So they believe that healing could take place with their gods. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, we have Kinechus, Osiris, the resurrection god. Horus, the god of heaven. Isis, hmm, what a familiar name. Uh, she was the goddess of maternity and birth. Seth, uh, the god of brute strength, war, and violence. Then we have Hathor, the goddess of love, happiness, dance, and music. Thoth was the god of writing, wisdom, music, and spells. Then the funeral god to welcome people was Anubis, welcoming dead people. Thath, a creator of magic master. And then uh, if you wanted to be the son of Nut, you could be uh, the son of Nut, the creator of the universe and stars, Matt, uh, who she symbolized universal justice and balance. So all these qualities... The plagues were directly connected to the gods of Egypt. The principal audience God was desiring to communicate with related to these plagues and gods was the Israelites, not the Egyptians. The Israelites had grown up with these gods. So too in America, our plagues are directly connected to the gods that we worship. So here's a summary slide of all those gods and images, all the plagues. And now looking at each of the 10 plagues individually, the first one had to do with waters turned to blood. They would worship the Nile River 
They worshiped the God of the Nile, and consequently God had to show that he was more powerful than all their gods. And so that plague came upon that. All these are other gods, frogs, lice, flies, livestock. Again, they said their God could heal. He gave them unhealable boils, hail, fire, locusts, darkness, their gods. Some of them were the gods of darkness, and also death of the firstborn uh, was also something that they were stricken with. And so uh, I have found that this topic, though very heavy, you know, sometimes you just got to laugh at life. Um, when 9-11 took place, and we had uh, obviously a trauma in our nation that I've never experienced even before or since, but four New York City firefighters two months later November of 2001, came to Roseville. And because we do a police and fire banquet uh, every year, uh, we invited them to come to our other building, Bonita, that's where we were then. And the building was packed, uh, standing everywhere, every seat, out the lobby, outside the building. We estimate there were 600 people in that building, which is smaller than this building, uh, breaking every fire code imaginable as all the police and fire stood there. But um, in that... <laughs> Uh, in that setting, and again, you wanting everything to be really right, okay? And yet two things took place that were like, I can't believe that happened. But they make you laugh. And at some point, it went from being horrified that it was taking place in the room to just laughing. And one of them was, instead of singing Amazing Grace in the bulletin and on a slide, we sang Amazing Graves. <laughs> Amazing Graves. Little typo there that was like, oh, no. So I'm sitting there, sweat beating to form my body. I can't believe this is happening. And then as we handed out plaques to the four New York City firefighters, the bulletin and the slides, instead of saying plaques, it said plagues. We handed out plagues. And so I had a comment then to them. I said, you know, guys, we... <laughs> We just got to laugh. I, th I said, I think God's just trying to lighten us up here. And the polite chuckles took place in the crowd. But it was an awkward moment. But so this message is so stinking heavy because these are issues that affect our lives. I mean, these are real demons that affect our lives, that affected me. Uh, and we're going to look at them. They're heavy topics. Uh, but I think of what the culture tries to do in this next slide. It's a Gary Larson cartoon. And um, it just says it. You know, the culture just says, you know what? Drink the potion. Drink the Kool-Aid. Become like us. And for those of us who did, I mean, I drank the Kool-Aid. I drank the potion. I was a worldling. I was an evolutionist, hedonist, anarchist, nihilist, uh, existentialist. I had all the is. I had is coming out my ears. And I finally wanted to kill myself. I was so isted. So uh, don't drink the Kool-Aid, folks. Don't drink the potion of the world. Uh, the Bible says that we should love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust thereof. So don't be fooled, okay? Don't be duped into following the plan. Okay, we love everyone. It's not a question of love, hate. No, we love everyone. I were them. I believed what they believed. But God rescued me. So here they are. Here are some of the gods of America. Uh, celebrity idol worship. Uh, and it's a big deal. I mean, I understand you can affirm people and esteem them, but uh, it goes beyond that. There are people that are groupies. Um, I, I think of even recently, last few months, I watched a family hour TV show where a celebrity began to advocate that women are goddesses and men are gods. So it isn't like, you know, some kind of a backroom story. They're believing that concept. And consequently, there's activity that happens with that. Um, false religions. Again, I've already alluded to that, that uh, I worshiped other gods. It cost me. Um, and so basically, we have to take an examination of the other religions. Even as a non-believer living in Hawaii, uh, my best friend in the world was a, a brilliant guy, a magna cum laude from Princeton, and, and we had studied world religions together. We were, were moving toward Eastern religions, chanting with Krishna, but on the island of Molokai, we both knelt together on a beach and prayed this prayer, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, we have studied your teachings. You are all not the same person. You will not mesh together. And it doesn't mesh. It doesn't fit. 
Uh, and within a few months, he was chanting in a, a forest up in Marysville for a month, Krishna over and over again until he was losing his mind. And he walked into the Episcopal church of his childhood, barefoot, saffron robe, beads, long hair, midday, knelt down in front of a cross and said, Jesus, I don't know what's going on with my life. I need your help. At that point, he, he's telling me this on the day I got saved. I was tracking his mother on Mother's Day, and he's telling me this story. And he said, Francis, I was knocked backward, and every question I had was answered. And I'm listening. He's like a credible source. He's like, whoa. And that night, I went up, received Jesus, was choked. And, you know, so the idea of world religions, you know, if you got I've studied them. I, I believe them. And they are not all one in the, in the same entity. Um, so evolution is the next one. And this I would call this pseudoscience. I understand it may, you know, you can do some smoke and mirrors to try and say these skulls and we came, you know. But the fossils say no. Everything that lived and died ultimately left a fossil. And if there's no staggering between each uh, of the graduated species, then ultimately the fossils don't exist. They don't exist. And so you can put some bones together and say it's a whatever man, but man, don't do it. And ultimately, we were created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, and I always love that highbrow folks trying to make us uh, get inspired. Well, you came from stardust, and, and you're going to go back to stardust. Isn't it amazing? It says, like, stardust. No, no, I was created in the image and likeness of God, a God who loves me and has given me an eternal destiny. I'm going to live forever, and I have a personality and character. I mean, don't just make me dust. And we try, you know, and basically the essence of their teaching is you came from nothing, and you're ultimately going nowhere. But make something out of your life. Stop. You're lying to me with a smile, and I'm not buying it. So may, may you not buy into that, okay? Next, racism. Big deal. Plague in America, man. I mean, and this affects all of us because our national history is 250 years of slavery, buying and selling people, and 150 years of segregation. And for those of my African-American friends who I'm very close to, who I spent time with this week, who I'm dear friends of mine, they have alerted me to the reality of that history, uh, that even from the Civil War, 19, I'm sorry, 1865 to 1950, 3,000 people were lynched. And I've seen pictures of white families having picnics after church with African-American men hanging on ropes, right there, smiling around it. This is a sick scenario. And so it affects people. I had father wounds. And you can't just say, Francis, get over your father wounds. Because at one point I would have slapped you, okay? I, I can't just get over my, my woundings. It takes some time. It takes some healing. So my father's been dead 51 years. I've been a Christian 46 years this May. It took me, uh, as a Christian, uh, 35 years to not have a bad thought about my dad. It just took a while, folks. It just took a while. And now I'm good. I'm doing okay now. But I can't tell people, get over your issue. When atrocities have happened, things have happened within races, uh, and our culture has to assume our national culture some responsibility for that. Again, I'm Sicilian. I was from an island in the Mediterranean. Don't blame me. I'm only kidding, okay? The point I'm making is I, I understand none of us go, well, I wasn't there. I wasn't a part. No, you know what? Empathize. At least empathize with the journey of someone yeah. Yeah. rather than say, it's not my deal. Get over it. Right. Yeah. Whatever's my wife's deal is my deal. Yeah. She was affected by my father wounds. These are my friends. These are my family. Their journey affects me. Yeah. And I, as a Christian, I want to have the empathy that's needed to listen, to care, to feel, and not be not just trying to rush them along in their journey. I understand that. So that's another thought for you. And so the racial divisions, you know, we are working on that in our region. I mean, we still believe we have an incredible shot here. We had meetings this week uh, in which Sacramento, this incredibly diverse, multiracial city, has a shot at bringing healing in dimensions in the body of Christ that could model for other 
other cities. And candidly, most of us who are leaders and believers here are aware of what's happening in other cities in our nation and recognize that um, if it can't happen in Sacramento, even though it's a crazy place in California, then it's probably not going to happen elsewhere because we have a better shot at it than some places that have. We have lesser history. If you're raised in the South, I mean, there's a lot of history there, man, that you're dealing with. Sacramento, California decided to not be a slave state because of Christians, uh, a Christian governor, Christian senator, of pastors, of half a dozen pastors in Sacramento in 1850 who said, we will not be a slave state. And they didn't uh, because. And so anyway, I'm grateful for being in this city and praying for a breakthrough. Next one. Again, I've got to zip through these plagues of, um, of God, of America. Obviously, the whole relational mutations, gender alterations. I do believe God made us male and female. I understand the journeys are difficult and complex. I just am going to stick with the Bible says. Sexual dysfunctions. I'm always amazed that, and again, I was a promiscuous man. I understand that. I, I understand that a generation uh, is being infected by things, uh, and yet we have to understand that there's consequence for our actions. I have consequence for my behaviors. Um, and so those things continue to breed uh, in our culture destructive dimensions. Uh, drugs. Uh, over-the-counter, under-the-counter, uh, legalization, whatever. Um, I smoked a lot of dopey in college, and ultimately it affected my life. And so I, I understand what it opens up. If it's medicinal, totally different deal. If there's a medicinal dimension, I honor the fact that that can help people uh, when given in a certain way, uh, but not just to get high. That's my conviction about that. Uh, then also, this is again, almost a non-Christian thought, uh, but I do believe gluttony is a big deal. I understand in, in the church, it's like a way, whatever. But uh, I have buried friends that I wish had not died. And until my son-in-law lost 60 pounds uh, more recently, I had no clue how to do that. And so I would be well-wishing. I'd pray for people but did not have a strategy. And so my wife and I are now health coaching people. I talked to a pastor two days ago who's 350 pounds, who's 34 years old, who has four children, who will die if he continues to go where he's going. And so I, I'm working with a number of people. Um, I believe that food is an issue in America. 58% uh, of young people today will be obese by the time they're 35. And so it's coming for us and our kids, and you can be a part of the solution. Uh, abortion. I had two aborted children. My heart uh, is broken over the next slide. Uh, and euthanasia, uh, with, with his, we're not talking about sending people to YWAM, euthanasia, but we're talking about taking the lives of people who are dying uh, because we don't want them to suffer. And I understand the pain of that, but from the womb to the tomb, it's God that gives and takes life. Having aborted two children, having rationalized them, and uh, ultimately, I only have two daughters now. I had two sons, Caleb and Noah, that I was a coward and was not willing to acknowledge their existence, but I'm not a coward anymore because I know I will see them again. And so when I die and go to heaven, I, I want to see my sons come over the hill. And I'm not going to go, I was too ashamed to show you. No, no. I was forgiven. I've been healed. I want to walk in the light. I went through healing. I've gone through healing sessions as a father of an aborted child. I'm now on a, a, a board for the uh, Memorial Garden off of Greenback, a part of New Hope Church, which will help people receive the healing they need. When they come to terms, connect those dots that it's not uh, an insignificant blob of tissue. That was an eternal being with an eternal soul, and you were the father, and you were the mother. Uh, I'm working right now with you know, people that couples that are just coming to terms about that. I'm working with a pastor, pastor, who aborted six children, and his wife still does not know. So we are we're trying to work with people who are coming to terms with the reality of these issues in their life. And they are big. Um, addition divorce. I know it's a big thing in our culture. I cohabitated. Uh, a girl begged me I was living with. I loved her for five years, lived with her for a year and a half. Begged me to have the baby she was pregnant with. Begged me to marry her under the George Washington. Remember the spot, the car, looking at her under the bridge, George Washington Bridge, New York. Her begging me, I don't believe in marriage. I don't want to have a baby. Drove her to a place in lower Manhattan to abort our first child. Um, 
before Roe versus Wade, 1971, and uh, stupidest thing I ever did, cowardly, naive, ignorant, uh, but cohabitation didn't handle it. I was not making commitments. I understand in the room there's folks who are divorced. God help us in the deal. But anyone who's married uh, needs to recognize I made vows, commitments. I want to stay married. It's God's plan. And then it moves into same sex marriage. I understand. It's a in vogue thing, trending. But uh, marriage between a man and a woman. I'm going with the biblical model. I realize uh, that some will think that's not the right way to go, but I'm, I'm sticking with God. At the end of the day, he's the only one that's standing, so I'm going to stick with him. Then lastly, uh, we have you know destructive fantasies, entertainment. There are people addicted. You know, the average video gamer is about 37 years old. There'll be these 65-year-old gamers. <laughs> I mean, it's an addiction. There's something happening there with people. It's a bondage. And you know, most movies, I've done studies on it, 46% of all movies throughout history uh, were fantasies, some kind of otherworldly, supernatural, it involves something getting you out of reality. I'm not negating, I'm just saying understand these things make us believe lies and illusions about things. Uh, have someone come to the keyboard if you would please. Uh, I realize these are not warm, fuzzy topics, but they affect us and will affect you. And they're plagues. Uh, that ultimately connect to gods who are demons, and those demons will destroy your lives as they have some of us. Um, next slide. Uh, going back to that verse we saw in uh, Exodus 12, 12. I'd like you to read this out loud if you wouldn't mind, please. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. It took a while. They had skid marks all the way. Ten plagues later, they finally had to acknowledge after their man was destroyed that ultimately the gods they were following were not the one true God, the all-powerful God. Additionally, I want you to read this slide. We substituted two words, only two words. Read it out loud, please. I will execute judgment against all the gods of America, for I am the Lord. After this, the Americans will know that I am the Lord. Bam. Simple uh, transition of the words uh, that affect us, that our gods affect our lives. And so um, I want to just share two final verses um, that I feel are the proper perspective. Because I have friendships, I hope you have friendships with sinners. I hope you're not living in a monastic world where somehow you're living in a cloistered environment and you can't talk to them because they're sinners. I hope you are working with sinners, loving, fellowshipping, I mean, relating to them, caring for them, not adopting their gods, but reaching out to them. That's why we're here. We're salt and light in this generation. But the Bible says about how we should relate to people, Ephesians chapter 4, it says, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And so when I think about the stuff that's happening in this world and the plagues, and the, I think about my issues. First of all, I want to get my heart right that I would then have compassion for others, not condescension. We have plenty of condescension. We're really full up right now with condescension. We don't need any more, okay? Additionally, another, another scripture talking about how we communicate, but if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out, beware of destroying one another. Our culture is so fragmented, so vilifying one another that it's potentially going to blow up. And those of us who are spiritual, who know the God of unity, the God of oneness, the God who said, let them be one as we are one, we are endeavoring to have unity together. Difference may be a perspective, difference of journey, difference of experience, but a unity of hearing one another, respecting each other, empathizing with each other, carrying on that kind of conversation. And if that could be modeled for our nation, it would change our nation. But if the church can't do it, our nation is doomed, I'll just tell you. If the church cannot model that type of healthy communication, then we will go to war with one another. And that will be a tragic thing. Has it ever happened? Uh, we had a civil war, I remember that. That could happen again. 
unless we're willing to love each other, listen to each other, respect each other, honor each other. We just produced a video that we showed to hundreds of pastors this week, and we had leaders of color speaking to one another, and all of us, in addition to Caucasian pastors, about the necessity of respecting, honoring, valuing, listening to one another. We must do that. Let's all stand together. We're just going to deal with our stuff right now for a moment before we go. What, what issues, what idols, two dimensions, we're going to just pray and, and let you go. What two dimensions? One is any idols, gods that are assaulting you. Maybe they got stuff on you that you need to get off you. Or maybe there's someone you really love that you're reflecting on right now. And you're going to pray for them. Every one of our hearts should be concerned. Either for us and someone else. So would you close your eyes? I want to pray for you. Father, I pray for these men and women that are in the battle. They're warriors, Lord. We all are wrestling against flesh and blood. Not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. We're all fighting for our lives, God. We're not just fighting for us. We're fighting for others. We're fighting to grab a hold of the truth that will set us free and set them free. We're not making things up. We're not rewriting truth. We are examining eternal truth and embracing it. So I pray today, Lord, that men and women in this room would come to terms in their own lives about any areas of compromise, any areas of fudging, any areas of uh, making a friend of an enemy, believing a lie that is really undoing their lives and not helping them. And I pray as they pray this prayer for themselves first, that they would be able to be set free from the bondage, from the destruction, from the deception that the enemy is bringing upon them. And then secondly, Lord, I pray for those in the room that are thinking of other loved ones they care about, friends, neighbors, relatives, spouses, children, parents that are caught up in some of the plagues of this earth, of America. We ask for your grace to be upon them. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you would pray sincerely from your heart, uh, I want you to pray from the bottom of your heart this prayer. Just thinking of you first. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, I don't want to be bound by any plagues, by any of the values of this world. I belong to you. You are the one who died for me. You're the one who desires to rescue me. So I surrender my heart to your will, to your truth, to your word. I bow my knee to you and submit myself to your lordship. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins, for having my plagues put upon you and then rising from the dead that I can live a victorious life. I pray for my loved ones who are bound by deception, who are bound by these plagues. Remove the scales from their eyes. Remove the hardness from their hearts. Remove the deception from their minds. Awaken them to their true identity. Like Nebuchadnezzar of old, Father, I thank you for every man and woman in this room. Lord, I pray that we would all submit to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would be the God of our lives, that your word would be a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, and that we would follow you all the days of our life. I bless them now in the name and the authority of Jesus Christ. Everyone said, give God a hand. Amen.